Today we're lucky to have Professor Ian Mitchell visiting us from the University of British Columbia. Um, and um, it's pretty great to have him here. He is, in fact, one of uh, the first people to have ever done research under Claire. In fact, I believe he's the first PhD student to have graduated under her. So um, many of us here know him as the author of the Level Set Toolbox, uh, of which there is a demonstration here. Uh, it's something that we, we use a lot to compute uh, reachable sets and general verification for hybrid systems. Um, so, you know, I think in a very relevant way, Ian has had an impact on, on many of us. And since Claire is here, I think it's, uh, it's ideal for her to say a few words about him before he starts his talk. Yeah. Um, so thank you, Ian, for um, uh, uh, coming down to um, uh, stay and, and give us this uh, visit and talk and all of your advice, both today and I'm sure tomorrow, but really over the past year since you left um, California for Northern Climes. Um, Ian uh, finished his PhD at Stanford in 2002, right? And then um, uh, got a job at, in the CS department at UBC, but decided that he would delay that for a year and come came to Berkeley, um, really good decision, and did a year, year postdoc working with Praveen and Shankar and Edward and a number of other folks here. Um, and um, as Jaime said, this, uh, this particular set, or actually as Ian said when he saw one of my talks that wasn't too long ago, that set is now old enough to drink, at least in Canada, <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> and drive um, in the US as yep. well. Um, and uh, let's see, what else can we say? So um, Ian just uh, is on sabbatical this year. Um, he just stepped down from a three-year appointment as the associate head of the Department of CS. And when he goes back from his sabbatical, they're probably going to ask him to be the um, oh, head of uh, CS. Oh, yeah, so. I didn't <laughs> can ask all they want. <laughs> so welcome, Ian, and thank you for coming. Thanks very much, Claire and, uh, and Jaime. And, and thanks so much for coming out this afternoon to uh, see a talk on a, on a well, I don't know, maybe, you, maybe you're used to this, but I come from Vancouver, and the thought of having uh, sunshine in October is, what is this thing? So uh, I really enjoy coming down. Uh, <laughs> are, are you Im implying that we don't pay taxes in Canada? <laughs> so I am afraid, despite Alex's promises in an email, uh, for those of you in Alex's group, that I'm not going to show you that blobby in part of my talk um, for two reasons. One is um, I'm going to talk about different ways of calculating these things. And the second is I still haven't figured out how, ways to make animations pop up in uh, latex slide decks. So um, I, uh, I have tried a number of ways. I'd love to hear ideas. But I am going to talk to you about model checking using uh, rel relatives of reachability, uh, with the motivation being human in the loop shared control of continuous systems. And this is the one that's uh, the main motivation for my own research these days, is uh, the idea of a shared control smart wheelchair. And so um, we have this challenge in the US and Canada, Europe, uh, Japan, uh, of an aging population. And we know that as people age, that their mobility decreases and that mobility uh, challenges, not just for older adults, for everybody. Any kind of mobility challenges lead very directly to a number of negative outcomes. Social isolation, reduced quality of life, and actually loss of mental function. Uh, it turns out that our mobility as infants is one of the main things that drives our development of our brains in very early years. Uh, and we are facing these challenges with older adults that as they lose mobility, they lose the stimulation to keep their minds agile. And so we want to try to provide that. Um, often older adults don't have the strength to use manual wheelchairs, so they end up in long-term care facilities being in a manual wheelchair and being pushed around and left in a corner uh, for the whole day. Uh, and of course, the challenge is that you give them a power wheelchair. This is potentially dangerous because of comorbidities like sensory loss, 
uh, tremors or uh, cognitive impairment. Cognitive impairment is, is the focus of my work. Uh, and those of you who've read a bit about smart wheelchairs will know that people have been doing this for 50 years. I mean, this is one of the earliest and most common robotic systems that roboticists, auto, automated automation roboticists tried, tried through the uh, 70s, 80s, 90s to build a smart wheelchair because it's such a compelling um, application. So why on earth did I get into this? Well, a couple of reasons. Uh, of course, you know that our ability to do ro robotic autonomy has exploded in the last few years. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with uh, improvements in low-cost sensors. Uh, and the other thing that came into this was that I was able to join a team that included not just computer scientists and roboticists, but um, people in, who are wheel mobility experts and who know, understand the population, have access to the population, and who we can work with to uh, work directly with this population uh, to understand their needs. So, how do you go about understanding the needs of this population? These first few slides, those of you who saw my talk two years ago, this is, I, I'm using, reusing some of those as, as a motivational, on um, the motivational side. So, we had this challenge uh, that although we set out to make sure that we did testing with the user population, our early prototypes would take years to finish to get to the point where we felt safe putting them into a long-term care environment. And then we tested them and, you know, you put somebody in the chair and within five minutes you realize, oh, I did that thing wrong. And so it's, it's really frustrating to uh, have to wait so long to get to the point where you can test these things. And so we adopted, uh, the, so the other thing we did was we did a lot of interviews with the target population. But what we discovered was that the people who are good at doing interviews they're typically not roboticists. We didn't have any roboticists who could do these kind of interviews at the time. Uh, nobody had any idea what they were talking about in these interviews. And they didn't give us, as engineers, useful data. So we discovered after the fact that if we had used the word wayfinding instead of path following or pathfinding in the interviews as one of the features that we could add to a robotic wheelchair, we might have gotten useful information. But when we said path finding, everybody just assumed the wheelchair was going to drive itself. What we actually meant was GPS. It was going to help you figure out which doorway to go through. It was going to suggest a doorway to go through. So that was the challenges that we faced. So the second time we did this, you always try to fix your bugs on the second time and end up with something that's too complicated. And we did that. Um, the second time we did that, we decided to do a Wizard of Oz study where we had a grad student um, pilot the wheelchair remotely and pretend to be the smart wheelchair system. And then we took that out into the uh, long-term care environment. Ten participants is a very small number for a human studies trial, but that took three months of two grad students working uh, 60 hours a week. It is a difficult population to reach. Um, so we tried to get as much data as we could from those 10 participants. So this was what they were asked to do, five different tasks. Uh, from something called the Power Mobility Indoor Driving Assessment, which is a standard assessment used to try to figure out whether people are suitable for power wheelchairs. So you basically like had a grad student finding ideal paths, whatever they want to do. So uh, I'll describe that. Okay. <laughs> so for example, if the task was to dock at a table, then we had three different control policies that we tried out. So they were asked to do each of these five tasks with three different policies, and each policy was repeated three times. So a total of 45 little runs. Each run was a couple of minutes long, but this occurred over two weeks. You could only do nine runs a day, basically, because of timing constraints. Um, and so, for example, in this version, what happened was we told the participant that they're going to be doing the automatic mode, and then we said, your task is to dock with the table. Are you ready to go? And when they said yes, Bikram drove the chair to dock with the table. And if they pushed back on the joystick, the system would shut down. But if they just left the joystick alone, it would drive perfectly to dock with the table. Peter this is, is the person with... No, power wheelchair. Sorry. Power wheelchair, okay. 
Um, so this is the absolute perfect robotic wheelchair system. Bikram had been driving this thing around in the basement of our building for months before these trials started. He could stop this thing on a dime. He could park perfectly. You couldn't build a better smart wheelchair uh, than what Bikram was able to drive this thing. So this is sort of the idealized robotic autonomous system. This one was Bikram just watched to see how close you were to obstacles. And so as you approach the table, he would slow you down, come to a stop, and then allow you to drive forward really slowly, what we call docking speed. Okay, so that's the basic stop procedure. And then... Just a joystick. So we... The, the, Oh, we were using an off-the-shelf power wheelchair. So we, we were plugged, Bikram's controller was plugged in through uh, an auxiliary port that allows um, non-standard joysticks to be plugged into the wheelchair. And we were basically pretending to be a joystick. The reason I'm asking is because how could you slow down so much? Yeah, so the way we did it was we took what the user's input was and, and scaled it down by, like I said, we, we produced a joystick input that was 50% you know, of what the user was producing. Uh, we did not want to touch the internals of the, the chair. These, these things are, uh, it's a touchy subject. Even fiddling, we couldn't, we couldn't for example, well, we're, we're trying now, but we couldn't, for example, make this a commercial product. The, the FDA would freak out if you plug something like this into the auxiliary port. So, um, but for research purposes, we could, we could do this. Uh, so the middle one was, you know, we tried to find something in the middle. So it, it does this slow down procedure, but in general, if the obstacle gets too close, Bikram would, grit, would um, smoothly steer you away from the obstacle. And then once you were far enough away, he would return control to you. So he took full control for a moment and then returned it to you. Yeah. And from a technical point of view, there's all sorts of neat stuff there. But we did not investigate the technical side of things. We were investigating the human factor side of things in this case. So, so we collected data, primarily this qualitative data. And this was based on transcripts of the driving. So I said three months full time. And then tw 15 months of analysis on the data. So hours of transcriptions from each participant uh, to come to understand the, this or to perform this thematic analysis of the qualitative data to try to extract as much information from these 10 participants as possible. Um, and there was some quantitative data taken, but this, these two uh, turned out to show nothing, basically. We couldn't see any difference between the different policies. Uh, it, it almost seemed like random data from it. Even individual participants seemed to almost randomly be picking uh, numbers on these surveys. So in the end, we didn't get anything useful out of that. The, I'll show you the ranking in a minute. Um, so there was a number of things that came out of this. And if you're interested, you can uh, take a look at the paper. It's got a lot of, it, it breaks things down by themes. It's got quotes from the individual participants. Um, but the key ones that I wanted to point to for the purposes of this talk are that the participants wanted to be involved in the decision making at both the high level and the low level at all times. Even if it was the decision, I would like to give up my autonomy for this hallway, for example, because the hallway is crowded. But then you, you give it back to me at the end of the hallway or when the crowd has passed or something like that. So there was, and, and finally, the study wasn't designed to test for this, but based on the qualitative comments we got, we see that there seems to be a lot of desire for flexibility in the level of support provided. So you don't, there's not, it's not ones, it's not even one size fits one. It, it is changing all the time with every participant. Uh, in some cases, we have clear evidence that the participants would want it to be changing fast, like on the scale of seconds, the amount of control that they're granted. 
So, like I said, a bunch more of these. I'm not gonna. Uh, I'm not gonna go through them all. But here's this. This was sort of a key quote from one of the participants. They would prefer to drive themselves rather than be driven. So, this is the quantitative data. This is pairwise preference, and the one that I want to point you to is, so the basic steer, basic stop nobody likes particularly, but here's the one I want to compare, compare, which is fully autonomous versus the steering. And the steering is preferred more than the fully autonomous mode. And that is despite the fact that Bikram is perfect. There aren't any sensors that are better than Bikram's. He will not, he did not crash anybody, except Pooja, the postdoc who was running the stu study. Uh, he did not crash any of the participants in, in the whole study. Um, he, you know, there were just, there were no problems with Bikram's uh, 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 policies. And even though the steering, the steering uh, control thing had some issues, particularly handing back control, there tended to be a fairly large jerk as he handed back control because the user inevitably didn't have the joystick in the same place as Bikram had it when he pressed the button that released his, his uh, uh, control. Um, but the users still generally preferred it and they preferred it for every task except the hallway task. Um, not entirely clear why, but... And they preferred it over the basic stop. Yeah, but the ba I mean, we knew the basic stop would not be great. From, based on our previous study, but we we decided to keep it in there rather than having uh, baseline control, which would have been let them do it themselves, um, because we were we you know we were a little concerned, and we also wanted to to have a sort of very simplistic policy uh, to see how people did. This this scheme did not do any wayfinding. This was purely obstacle avoidance. You know, can you accomplish the task under an obstacle, some kind of obstacle avoidance? scenario. So the conclusion I draw from this is there are systems for which you do not want autonomy even if the autonomy is perfect. And there's lots of other contexts where this is true. So there are often situations where it is difficult or impossible to transmit the full information about the goals to the autonomous system or perhaps that the human doesn't know all the goals that the uh, autonomous system has to uh, resolve. This one is very big in the uh, anesthesia domain. It turns out it is essentially impossible to induce anesthesia without breaking some rules. Um, they, the rules are contradictory. You have to get the person under in a certain, or you there there is a maximum amount of time to induce anesthesia, and there's also a maximum amount of anesthesia you're allowed to deliver. And it turns out you can't satisfy both of those two constraints. So it's just, you know, anesthesiologists know that at the induction phase, you give them a big whack of uh, bolus, I guess is the medical term, of the anesthesia, which breaks the rule about the amount per second that you are allowed to deliver, but you just do it once. You do it right at the beginning when there is no anesthesia in the system, and most people survive that. Um, <laughs> it's, you know, anesthesia is the, by far the most dangerous part of most operations. So... Um, Sometimes it's difficult to uh, uh, identify the goals a priori, um, uh, and uh, say, sometimes you have systems where the safety margin is varying a lot, and the human can't sort of figure that out. It's not natural for the human to figure out how these things are, are working. These two I find kind of interesting. This one here turns out that Wizard of Oz study, the part, the trainers in the long-term care facilities who are working with us saw Bikram's remote control and they said, oh, that is cool, can we have one of those? And, and we have now transitioned that to a full randomized control trial looking at the use of a remote control for training purposes to do zero failure training. So in other words, you don't let the human fail to drive the wheelchair without collisions. And you might think to yourself, that doesn't sound like a very good idea. I mean, machine learning tells us that it's very, it's, you're much better off if you can have positive and negative uh, examples in your training set. 
Well, turns out it's not so good to have negative examples in a training set that involves older adults driving power wheelchairs around. And there's a fair amount of psychology literature that says that for certain populations, it is very bad to, have fa to allow for failures. You're much better off actually putting them through a zero failure protocol in which you build up their confidence. Confidence is often one of the biggest challenges in these populations, and this is one of those populations. I, I mean, you could view it that way, but I'm viewing failure as as a, a predefined cr like a crash in the case of a wheelchair. So yes, your automation may have failed to if Bikram had to take over. I'm here. I'm thinking of um, if you can do shared control, maybe that will allow you to run a system. I mean, this is this is what Tesla's doing. Is they're they're giving you fully autonomous vehicles, but they're saying, well, it's it's your you know the vehicle may decide that it doesn't want to drive anymore, and you need to be ready to take over like that. And this allows them to run millions of miles of testing on their autopilot uh, for free. <laughs> so that that's the that's the, the the context in which I'm thinking of the the zero failure bootstrapping. Um, but I mean, you could also interpret it that that way. Um, I'm interpreting it as the system has some safety criteria you need to satisfy, and, I, and you would like to um, avoid failing that, those safety criteria during this shared control uh, mode. So. Also, it's really worth noting that the learning here is not being done by the system, it's being done by the human. Right. Th this one here is, is the human is learning. This one here is, I, I'm thinking, you're, you're running a machine learning algorithm. I, I'm not doing this one, but we do have a, a study where we're, we're doing this one. Again, in a Wizard of Oz fashion, because we're not using automation, but that's the next step uh, to, to use automation. So I use this all as motivation to say, how do we characterize the set of safe controls? And those of you who work in Claire's lab um, have been studying this problem for a long, long time, uh, and um, it's more than just reachability. So reachability is a way of demonstrating the system is safe or unsafe, but it's, in a sense, reachability is, is kind of a set-based version of finding a trajectory, a, satis a satisfying or failing trajectory. And in this case, we want to find the set of controls that will allow us to remain safe because we want to provide the human with as much authority as possible subject to remaining safe. So the outline of my talk is I'm actually going to talk about techniques for building sets of viable controls, so sets of controls that will keep you safe. Um, I, the first part of my talk was about the human factor stuff. I'm now going to Turn off the human factor stuff, and this next, the, the the rest of this this talk is quite mathematical. I really enjoyed myself for a month uh, sitting down and doing old-fashioned uh, reachability calculations, uh, and so I'll tell you a bit about that. And if there's time at the end, I'll tell you briefly about the anesthesia project, uh, where we were looking at a different model of robustness and uh, ways of handling conservativeness in a uh, robust framework. So first I'm going to talk a bit about the uh, situate or the, uh, uh, the background uh, in which I, I did this construction, and then talk about three classes of sets, invariant sets, uh, which I'm sure you're all uh, aware of, viable sets, and uh, finally discriminating sets, which are a combination of the two. So let's first actually talk about what those sets are. This is the invariance kernel. So given some set of states, which are the safe set of states, out here in blue, we want to calculate the set of states that give rise to trajectories which stay inside the safe set forever, or over some finite horizon. In this case, we're looking at finite horizons. So you can think of this as any inputs, any parametric uncertainty in your dynamics is being treated in a worst case fashion. If it 
pushes, pushes you outside S, then you're not in the invariant set. Okay? That's the first construct. The second one is kind of the opposite of that. Now you have some parameters, your control, param control input parameters, that you're allowed to use to try to keep you inside the safe set. So in this case, this would be, you know, airplane is flying, and I'm using my flight controls to keep me safe. Okay? So that will be larger than the invariant set, often called the controlled invariant set. And this is the input being treated in a best case fashion, trying to keep me safe. The discriminating kernel is the combination of those two. We've got some inputs that are trying to push us out, some inputs that are trying to keep us in. I have yet to figure out a good way of drawing those trajectories, because there's multiple trajectories for every single input, and eh, so I'm not going to try to draw it. It's also often called the robust controlled invariant set. So you have control invariants, because your inputs are trying to keep you in, and it's robust to the disturbance inputs that are trying to push you out. So two different inputs, U is my control, V is my uh, disturbance input, and they are working against one another in a best case, worst case fashion. The final construct I'm going to use is just a for standard forward reach set. It's the set of states that you can get to, uh, starting from some initial set S at exactly some time. This is not the reach tube, this is just the reach set. And I'm going to use this to construct the other sets. <clears throat> Okay, how am I going to calculate these things? Uh, Jaime mentioned the toolbox of level set methods. I love Hamilton-Jacobi equations. Uh, I love the, w the fact that they give you this very general framework for dealing with nonlinear uh, systems and for dealing with uh, complex shapes. They do not scale so well. Who here has managed to run a four-dimensional Hamilton-Jacobi? Excellent. Five? Yeah? Six? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know, Mo has pushed it quite high, but they, they do not scale particularly well. And, and you know, the five-dimensional one, I ran that. Um, I had to go home um, shortly before finishing at Stanford, because uh, I had to, you know, get married. Uh, and I took my laptop with me, and I kind of knew I wasn't going to get any work done that week that I was home before the wedding. So I just put the laptop in the corner and let it run on a five-dimensional <coughs> reach set. And yeah, after a week, it had calculated a rather coarse approximation for a five-dimensional landing example. Uh, which appeared in one of the papers, and you know it's all good, but that's slow. And you know maybe that can be done in a day now on uh, a laptop. Uh, you know, a big machine might be able to do six dimensions. A big parallel machine, maybe not with my code. It's MATLAB. Um, so we need more efficient ways of tackling this problem. And the one I'm going to talk about today is called zonotopes. So we have a center vector, which tells us the middle of this object. It's a subclass of uh, polygons. Uh, and then we have a collection of what are called generators. Uh, these are vectors in, a, in the space that we're working on. And essentially, you can think of it as the Minkowski sum of the generator segments. Or you can think of it in this way. You just add linear combinations of the generators, where the linear combinations have to be between plus and minus 1. So these sets are centrally symmetric. Um, they can have a very large number of vertices. Uh, another way to think of them is they are a linear mapping of a high-dimensional hypercube. Um, uh, a hypercube in, in, in the dimension of the number of generators, and then you linearly map it down into a lower dimensional space. So there's a number of ways of interpreting uh, zonotopes. But the key thing is that they have this compact representation, which is the center vector and then a pile of these generator vectors. And in fact, I'm going to stack them up into a matrix. So each column of this matrix will be one of the generator vectors. And then once I do that, I can write down the set of states in this very compact form. It's the center plus the generators times some scaling uh, vector, where the scaling vector has to be between plus and minus 1. OK, so that's how you yeah. can yeah. characterize the set of states in, in a zonotope. Yeah. Can you give me, maybe Jess knows this, but I don't, some physical intuition 
for yeah so so what we're doing is we're starting at the center and we're going to go along one of these vectors let's say we go along g1 first we're going to go along g1 some amount between plus and minus one no 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 absolutely not this is just a way of of describing a set of states and i'm going to use that to represent the reach set just a set of states. Okay? Sometimes I'm going to write down this generator notation, this G representation, which is just the center and this G matrix, which is the set of generators. Um, it's a compact way of writing down uh, these sets. Yeah, it gives, it gives you degrees of freedom with which you can fiddle. So I can I can use I can just for example I could just use the identity matrix here, and then that would just give me a box. Um, but if I use three generators in 2D, I can get this sort of hexagonal shape, for example. So it gives me additional degrees of freedom, and I'll and I'll show you we'll sh we'll get to some sets where you can see uh, where these come from. So. One key thing that I'd like to mention about them is for any state that is not in one of the vertices, and I should say the number of vertices and the number of edges can be very large in the number of generators. So these things are not sort of trivial to work with in the uh, vertex representation or the half space representation that you sort of naturally think of when you're talking about polygons. Um, but the G representation is very compact for these, these uh, sets. So for any point inside the zonotope, there's a bunch of different ways to get there. So in this example, I can go up this generator and across, or I could go along this generator diagonally and then diagonally, two different ways of getting there. I could go up this generator, across, and then back along this generator, because you're allowed to go in the negative direction of a generator. So for any point on the interior of the zonotope, there's an infinite number of uh, possible lambda values that could get you there. Uh, for any state in the, in the zonotope, there's an infinite number of lambda coordinates that could get you to that state, except for the vertices. The vertices are, are unique. Um, but anywhere on the interior, we do have some flexibility in how we represent it in terms of the generators. And we're going to make use of that as we go along. So we'll come back to that when I get to vi viable sets after we talk about um, invariant sets. So the last property about zonotopes that I want to talk about is it's very easy to figure out whether they're contained within a box. You just take the absolute value element-wise of that generator matrix. And so you can see here, for example, the absolute value of this generator is just this generator. And then I'm going to multiply by negative 1 to get this vector. Likewise, this generator, I'm going to take the absolute value. Again, both of the elements are positive, so it's the same thing. And then multiply by negative 1 to get that red one. This generator, I'm going to take the absolute value, which will flip it over here, and then multiply by negative 1 to get this red, uh, green vector. And that tells me the lower left-hand corner of the box that contains the zonotope. And likewise, the upper right-hand corner is that constraint. Yep? So I must be missing something. Can you give some information about why the vertices have only a unique internal structure? Because they're not in the box. 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 Because yeah, because it's just a linear combination. The lamb, we're just multiplying this G matrix by a lambda vector, and and you know how how you apply that, what order you apply them is irrelevant. Um, what matters is whether or not there's a different lambda value, and I'll I'll show you why in a, a few slides. So how do we compute the forward reach set? And this actually, um, this work got uh, the first HSCC um, test of time award. I think that's what they called it, uh, at, uh, in Porto 
in April. Uh, it was work by Antoine Girard. The formulation he used in his original paper in 2005 is not what we use today. This paper actually came up with a, a nicer one. In fact, Lagernick's thesis has some very, a very nice uh, description of, of, of this material. So that's why I, I uh, cite this paper, because this formulation came, comes from there. But given a system that has a, single dis that has a disturbance input, could be a vector value disturbance input, a linear system that has a disturbance input, you can write down the forward evolution of a zonotope. So this is the set of states. If you start from a zonotope and your disturbance input is constrained by a zonotope, then this is the zonotope that you end up with. The center, the number of generators, and the generator matrix. OK, there's a bunch of linear algebra terms here, but now I'm going to take this construct and use it a bunch of times to construct the sets I want through a convex optimization. I'm going to, that, that's essentially what the, the rest of the talk is about, is various versions of zonotopes that I'm going to construct. And then I'm going to constrain them to a safe set and use convex optimization to try to find the best version of that zonotope that, um, that satisfies the dynamics and uh, stays within the constraint set. The dynamics that I'm going to consider are linear. So uh, I'm allowing for the control input u, the disturbance input v. I also add a drift term. You could factor the drift term into the set of, the, that, of inputs that v has, but it's a little more convenient to break it out uh, sort of in, in the development. So I'm going to break it out. And I'm going to let the disturbance be a general zonotope, but I am going to constrain the input to a box. Yep. Does this still help? It seems like you're you're able to talk about combinations of them. So that might reduce the, the complexity of calculating. So at the end of the talk, I'll I'll show a mostly linear system, partially nonlinear system, where we can capture the nonlinearity in the disturbance. So that's one approach to handle nonlinearity. And then there's some very nice work, uh, recent work by. Um, Sherman and Althoff, where they have used reachable reachability and zonotopes uh, in a model predictive control framework, where they linearize about a um, nominal trajectory, and then they use the linearized model on that nominal trajectory with disturbance, I think with disturbances included, and they, they can show that you will stay within a certain zonotopic bound of that nominal trajectory. So there's a, there's a couple of ways of tackling this. But the nice thing about the linear system, what I'll show is the, the mappings that I do here are exact. It's, I'm not approximating the reach sets. I'm get, telling you exactly what the reach set is. Yep. Sorry, when you said uh, stays within that zone of topical bound, the nonlinear system guarantees stay inside of that, or the linearized? Correct. So you, you, can, you can get the nonlinear system because you're bounding the, non -linear, the linearization error. So I, this work was very much in, uh, inspired by that, that work. Um, OK, so here's my goal. I want to try to find a zonotope that fits inside this set x, where x is a box. And you might say, box is rather simple. Well, yes, it is. And almost all the safety systems that I've dealt with actually are reasonably well, well represented by boxes or circles. And I worked with ellipsoids for a long time. They do a great job of circles. They do a lousy job of boxes. Um, now I'm going to try boxes. Boxes can do a reasonably good job of, uh, a lousy job of circles and a really good job of boxes. Um, what I, I can say is that you can fix this problem if you really need something that's a little more circular, uh, more easily than you can the other way around. It's really hard to get good ellipsoidal approximations of boxes, but I can build polygonal approximations of circles, and it's not too hard to change this constraint. It's just much easier to present in box form. Um, so it is absolutely true that I have a very simple set of dynamics, and I can write down the analytic solution. Um, but that's the price we pay in order to get accurate solutions. So as I said, the, the challenge here is efficient representations for viability. Early techniques for viability algorithms, including level set methods, 
you can do this with my toolbox, don't scale well. Don't scale to high dimensions. Um, some of uh, uh, some work that I've done with previous students, Shahab and, and John, showed that we could extend these things to parametric representations that scale well, but yeah, they have challenges. So uh, John had John's formulation was really nice, but I haven't figured out how, based on support vectors, I haven't figured out how to make it robust, and I, I haven't figured out how to make it continuous time. The ellipsoidal approach can handle all those things, robustness, continuous time, all of that stuff, and because ellipsoids do a lousy job of boxes, the accuracy is terrible, and I haven't managed to fix that. Um, <clears throat> 10,000 dimensions, reachability. And in fact, there's a paper, there, there, there's rumors, shall we say, floating around that somebody has added a bunch more zeros to that at the end of that and how many dimensions they can do reachability. Linear systems, but really, really high dimensional linear systems. And so I'd like to somehow or other get that kind of scaling. I'm not going to get there, but I'd like to be able to do more than six. Did you have a question, yeah. Regina? Yeah. No, different meaning of support vectors. Oh, okay. So yeah. Explain. Yeah. I, I, I don't have time today, but okay. I would be happy to. These are support vectors for what are called support functions, a way of representing convex sets, okay. which, I, I mean, they are connected, but they are not support vector machines. So I hope all the students will catch this. Sorry. Um, yes. Okay. So... Let's say something real quick about the 10,000 dimension method. What does it do? It works with uh, what are called generalized star sets, which are uh, uh, slightly more general than zonotopes. Um, and essentially, it maps them forward with repeated applications of A, discrete time systems. Uh, and you know, basically, they're showing that you can, you can essentially map uh, star sets forward very efficiently and test to see whether or not they intersect with uh, uh, hyperplanes. So simple algorithm, and, and they just they have a tool that can calculate these things in very high dimensional systems. So it, it comes down to efficient, um, uh, they, 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 they're working on efficient ways of multiplying matrices together, essentially, uh, and, and doing this test for intersection against a hyperplane. Um, so OK. So now we get to the actual meat of the talk. Uh, invariant sets. What I'm going to do is I'm going to hypothesize a shape of a zonotope, and then I'm going to try to grow or shrink it so that it fits into my safe set. That's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to set up a bunch of generators, the G, func the, the G matrix here, and multiply it by scaling factors, gamma. It's just a diagonal matrix. Yep, just a diagonal matrix here. Uh, and each of the gammas is greater than or equal to 0, which I can do because it's symmetric about the center. The set is symmetric about the center, so it doesn't matter. I can chop off all the negative gammas. Um, so that's all, that, that's, that is how I'm going to do invariant sets, <laughs> just rescaling zonotopes. Um, and you can show that, that it's, you can write down the constraints that, that the scaled zonotope has to satisfy. Um, based on the evolution of the, of the scaled zonotope. And then you can solve a linear program. Because <laughs> those constraints are linear in gamma, right here. And linear in alpha. I'm going to choose the center of the zonotope as well. And then I'm going to do a linear optimization, where I just try to maximize the size of the sum of uh, gamma. Gamma is positive. That doesn't get me the maximum size zonotope. Turns out, although there is a formula for the volume of a zonotope, it's quite complicated and it's combinatorial in the generators. Um, and so this, 
I don't know if I can write it down as a convex optimization, and it's big in a, if you have a large number of generators, whereas this is easy, and it seems to produce pretty good results. So this is the heuristic in this talk, is my objective function. I've got an, a, a heuristic objective function that seems to do a pretty good job, and I can produce these sets. This is just rotation. So depending on how many generators, I get a more or less accurate approximation of the true set, which is just a circle. But it's always inscribed. It's always inscribed, yep. That's the key thing. And this is, this is exact. The, the forward mapping is an exact calculation. And so there are trajectories that hit those boundaries. With disturbance inputs, so we have the center. We have to add the effect of the disturbance input and drift onto both the center and the generators. And then we had that scaling factor. Looks complicated, but it's just some linear algebra. And then we can solve that with you know, CVX. Takes a couple of seconds. Yep? This is sort of reminiscent of the work of Trio uh, and Sakurai. I remember how many syllables are in The flow pipe construction, he calls it. Is this related to that? Yeah, so the, the flow pipes that he's constructing are, are reach sets. So they're going out. You start with some, from some initial set, and you're going out in time, forward. This is, I'm starting with a constraint set and I want to stay inside. And I haven't got to the control inputs yet. That's the key thing, is I'm going to characterize the set of control inputs that will keep us safe. So this is the viable sets. Okay, so here's my double integrator. Favorite thing for viable sets. Um, I'm, I have to go to discrete time, so this is just the discretization. Here's the set of states that is the true viable set calculated with you know the level set toolbox. Um, so how do we characterize the set of viable controls? Which, you know, here, right here, the set of viable controls is quite constrained. You have to be slowing down as fast as possible. And same along here. Here, you can't go any faster. You can't have a positive value. And here, it actually doesn't matter. But the key thing to identify here is that it depends on the state. You can't just choose your control arbitrarily. And the disturbance input, the treatment we had in the previous slides for the invariant set, assumes that the input can be chosen, or any input can be chosen anywhere in the state system. So somehow or other, I have to, get a, I have to encode a state-dependent control input or control input set. So here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to go up in dimension. I'm going to create a new zonotope J which has the original scaled zonotope, and each of the generators gets a vector at the bottom that represents the control input. So in the double integrator case, that will just be a single number. So every generator in my initial uh, set is going to get its own control input associated with it. And those are free parameters. I'm going to choose those to accomplish my goal through an optimization. And likewise, the center of the control set. And this is a zonotope in a higher dimensional space. This set here, just taking the control parameters out of this thing, is also a zonotope, but this is not the cross product zonotope. You actually, these are attached. So if you go out along this generator, you have to use this control. And phi, capital phi will be dense. Unlike capital lambda, capital phi is dense. Every entry can be non-zero. How am I going to use this? I'm going to use the observation that I can stack up my linear system in this form. This is just a linear map. And therefore, if I take a zonotope and map it through a linear mapping, it's a zonotope. And so I can write down how that zonotope will evolve under that linear mapping. And that's my control input. And so this is my new constraint set. This is the control effect on the linear. Uh, the center, it's linear and beta, which is my, another free parameter. And this is the effect on the control effect on the generators, which is convex and gamma and capital phi. So those are the constraints I have to satisfy. These are the constraints to make sure that I don't violate my input range. Again, it's uh, linear and beta 
and uh, convex in capital Phi. And so I'm just going to solve the same convex optimization problem with these new constraints. And this is what I get. And look at that. There's that same curve on the side. That's a zonotope. And some sample trajectories. Takes a couple of seconds to calculate this thing with CVX. OK, what does this look like? Here's my initial set i before scaling and the associated set of generators. I put in 8, uh, 9, can't remember. Uh, here's the scaled set. If I take this scaled set without applying that rule that on, if you're on a given generator, you have to use the associated control, this is the set I get. It looks OK, but there's two spots where you actually fail to satisfy your constraints. Whereas if I use the control, the only difference is this one generator shrinks when I apply the control. But that's the generator that says you're up here. That's the generator that is important to this, this part of the shape. And that gets me this set as the one time forward mapping. And you can see that's within the constraint set. So that's what's happening. It, it absolutely touches. But touches touches is OK. I'm using closed uh, closed constraint set. Like I said, this is an exact mapping. This is exactly the set of states that you can reach uh, because I'm dealing with a linear system. These, there's no approximations there. The only approximation is that heuristic about trying to make the zonotope as big as possible. Uh, darn it. I told you that. My, I had a range of inputs that I could apply. And that range of inputs is based on that lambda value. The, the fact that I could get to a single point in the zonotope by using a different scaling of lambda and the, against the generators, that gives me a range of inputs. Here's the range of inputs. And this is all looks good because I've got lots of input authority. right? At the beginning here, if I have a very negative velocity, I need to use a very positive input. But if I have a velocity in the middle, I can use any input I want. But towards the end of the horizon, it disappears completely. Shoot! The problem is that I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not telling it to make that set big. I'm telling it to make I big, but I'm not telling it to make U big. And U big means this capital Phi big. But capital Phi can have positive and negative entries. And maximizing an absolute value is not convex if it can have positive and negative entries. <laughs> so how do I modify this to, to, to succeed? You yeah. scale it so it's all, oh, OK, sorry. So I, I do, again, I don't have a good answer to this. I have <laughs> one approach. And I think it's exactly what Claire was about to say. You can't, you can't just arbitrarily scale it, because the scaling and the sign relative to the generator scaling matters. Because if you scale it too much, you'll break your constraints. So this, was, this is the idea that I've come up with, which is to say, uh, what if I gave myself some flexibility using the control the same as the disturbance? So the disturbance, I can use any, I have some zonotope. And I can use any input in that zonotope anywhere in the state space. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to say, find me a zonotope such that I can use any input from that zonotope as my control anywhere in the state space. This is essentially saying, how robust am I to, to stupid control and potentially stupid control inputs? And so that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to, I, I have a scaling factor. The scaling factor is positive. I can maximize it. Um, I can maximize the, the, the sum of the scaling factors the same way I did with the sum of the scaling factors on the state zonotope. And so this is, this is what you end up with, the evolution of the zonotope. These are the constraints that you end up with. And this is the optimization problem. I've taken my original, and I've just tacked on this additional scaling factors and said, make those as big as you can. Um, and convex optimization still. Heuristic objective function, but works. I get the same viable set, 
But the set of viable controls, here's the old version, the new version. Initially, the set of viable controls look the same, and it's big. So I don't really care that I don't have a lot of completely free control. But down here, where the original version collapsed, it's actually enormous, my free control. And this is essentially because it's finite horizon. Basically, the system is saying, I'm getting close to the end of the horizon. Do whatever you want. <laughs> so, you know, in the final time, it's basically exactly do whatever you want because I, I only need to stay safe for another two steps. So, but this gives you some flexibility. So, discriminating sets are combining that. You have both disturbance inputs and control inputs. And the equations look complicated. But coding them up is actually easier than writing them down in LaTeX. So <laughs> you can do it. Not, not as bad as it looks. So here's the quadrotor model. Uh, this is thanks to Forrest, uh, who I guess unfortunately couldn't make it. This was a system that we studied in a 2016 paper using the ellipsoidal techniques. And I'll show you a comparison in a minute. Nonlinear system in the velocity. The other four dimensions are, are linear, but there's nonlinearity in the velocity terms here. Uh, and here's the linearization uh, about some operating points. In this case, we're going to choose an operating point which is stable hover, so flat, and the, the thrust is counteracting gravity. Here's the constraints. Um, can't remember what room this was, but this was the measurements of the room. Uh, this were some guesses about how fast you should be flying around the room. And these were, this one in particular was, how do we keep this, the range of this variable small enough that the linearization error doesn't kill us? Because this is the x5, it's sine and cos x5 that is the nonlinear term here. Um, and likewise down here. And what I was able to do with the zonotope version is uh, more than double the size of this interval. This interval was entirely driven by linearization challenges. Um, and so now we can basically do the computation for a larger range of states. The linearization is safe for a larger range of states because of the increased accuracy. So here's the results. I used 48 generators. Turns out only 11 of them were non-zero. Uh, discretized to, with 40 steps at a time step of 0 0.05, which is still a little large. Um, but uh, I wanted to do a run that took about 15 minutes, because that's what the ellipsoidal technique that we used took, about 15 minutes on a laptop. And only 11 of the generators turn out to be non-zero effectively. Um, 11 of those 48 generators. And there's the set. But they don't tell you an awful lot. Here's the comparison. So we're comparing this red line with this green blob. Uh, this is the calculation using the ellipsoidal technique from two years ago. This is the calculation using the new zonotope technique. And you can see that essentially the entire set of states is controllable versus before, where we didn't have a lot of them controllable. Almost the entire set of state versus velocity is controllable, except for the corners. This is a double integrator. So not surprisingly, the corners are not controllable. Same in this dimension. And again, almost the entire range of um, uh, angular velocity. No, sorry. Yeah. A yeah, angular velocity and ang angle is controllable. This is the one. These states are fine. This is the one where the time discretization is not very accurate. It's, it's roll. Um, it needs to be, I need a finer time discretization to get that one better. So, OK. So there are some limitations here, big one being the heuristic objective function. The good thing about that objective function is that it seems to encourage sparse solutions. So, and it seems to be doing a reasonably good job of making things big. Um, Again, the state dependent control authority is not being maximized. I'm maximizing the state independent control authority. But the goal is to give you control authority. So in a shared control context, this may actually be the right choice. Um, but you know, there's some stuff you have to play around with. I can't handle fully nonlinear systems. You're going to have to hybridize. Um, and the big one intellectually is this question of how do we 
take continuous time dynamics into account. Because of the way we're formulating this as an optimization, it's not clear. We can't use the standard techniques that have been used for converting continuous time to discrete time. So not quite sure how to handle that one, but something to work on. So we can calculate these sets um, using convex optimizations. And we can play around with the accuracy by choosing the number of generators. We can build state-dependent con state contr viable control sets. And we can use this on somewhat nonlinear models by handling the nonlinearity, or the linearization error as part of the disturbance. It's accurate and it's scalable at least to these kind of systems. Six dimensions, not a big deal. It, like I said, it took about 15 minutes to run. So we'd like to... I didn't do any of the fancy tricks to achieve scalability in these other papers, and I believe we can apply them. I mean, what took a long time in some of these cases was the fact that I was dealing with this dense matrix A and multiplying it over and over again. Um, and those are some of the techniques that uh, Stan and Para Sira um, used in order to achieve 10,000 dimensions. Um, I'd like to extend this to capture basins. That's relatively straightforward. I'd like to incorporate this multiplicative model uncertainty, which is the anesthesia stuff that I didn't get a chance to talk about. Um, and then, this is the big one, how do we use this online uh, to provide uh, safety constraints on shared control systems? So thank you very much. I apologize for going over. Right. Um, so maybe something we can do is, given that uh, it is a little over time, people who have to leave because they have something else going on can maybe leave now. And people who want to stay over for a couple of questions, it'd be great if, if Ian can stay for a few minutes. And I'm sure people have questions. So uh, maybe Samuel can have the first one. Ian, can you provide some intuition on what sort of systems would require like more generators uh, than others? Not yet. I haven't done enough of these. I really thought when I put together, I chose those 48 generators based on looking at the dynamics of the system. And I was surprised that we only needed 11 of them. Uh, and one thing I did do was I said, OK, well, what if we just randomly sprinkled in a bunch of random, or we put in a bunch of random generators. What if I'm missing something? So I added, in one run, I added 48 random generators. And not one of them was chosen. So I threw them away. And you know, one of the things I'd like to do is, you know, what if I added 1,000 random generators? Well, I can't do that on my laptop. It's, I don't have enough memory. Um, uh, just to see whether. There, there is some coupling that maybe I'm not capturing in the, in the chosen generators. But for the quad rotor here, there's a lot of double integrators. And that's how I chose the generators. As I said, look, these ones look like double integrators. And eh, I'll throw in a couple of diagonals. Um, and it, it seems to be doing a reasonably good job because the random generators weren't chosen. So I, zonotopes are hard. I haven't got an intuition for zonotopes yet. Shape. Yeah. Well, the key question is what coupling do you need, right? So, do you need generators that are out in six dimensional space, or do you just need to couple certain, certain pairs of dimensions together? So, in this case, I only manufactured generators in dimensions that were coupled in the linear system, plus I threw in these extra diagonals. One of the diagonals was chosen. Even though it's not directly coupled in in the in the uh, in the original system, one of the coordinate axes was not chosen. To my surprise, the x5 coordinate axis doesn't appear in this set of 11, and so somehow or other it it is constrained. So somehow or other it's being captured in the other generators that are being cap captured there. So I'm not quite sure. Yes. Oh, sorry. Well, I think we yep. have a person first. And, yeah. And then sorry, I didn't realize Jaime yeah. handed over the. Um, so, since you're working with linear systems, do you think it's possible to apply your techniques to uh, template polyhedra, for instance, that are a bit more general than zonotopes? Uh, 
I have been puzzling over the question of can I apply this to star sets, which are, they, they're like zonotopes, but not centrally symmetric. And it comes down to this question, you remember I, I mentioned that I can, I can use only scaling factors that are positive uh, because the generators are symmetric, or sorry, the zonotopes are symmetric, and I'm not, I'm not sure whether I can do that without losing some of the um, uh, power of the, zone, of the zonotope representation, but it's something I need to think about. Then what about going to more general uh, representations, polygonal representations, and I haven't thought so far along those lines, but what you, what you need to have is some kind of representation where you can do the containment tests that you want to test. So you need to have an exact forward mapping and you need to be able to do these containment tests, and you need to somehow capture the, the, the state-dependent control. And I think all of these things can be done. I, I should mention another one of uh, Sherman and Althoff's paper. They look at essentially this problem where they constrain the controls to be linear feedback controls. And they get a slightly different set of, of optimization problems that they, they uh, solve. And they create a different robu uh, robust reachable set. So that's another way that you could parameterize the set of inputs. Um, and maybe there's a way of doing, uh, of capturing the, the parameterization. I'm parameterizing both the set of inputs and, and the set of states as a zonotope, but maybe you can, you don't have to use the same parameterization for both. So, I don't know if I really need a microphone. No, it's just because it's being recorded. I guess people are watching ah, it. Ah, okay. Um, yeah, so the, on quick glance here, quad rotor um, test case, looked like one of those problems that with a coordinate transformation and using uh, polar coordinates instead of Euclidean, that it would become linear. And I, so I was wondering, I mean, does this methodology work with polar coordinates, or is there something distinctly Euclidean about these zonotopes? I would be worried about the periodic boundary conditions if I was working in polar coordinates. Can you just arrange your box so that it doesn't, it never, it never yeah. gets to the wrapper? So it, it might be... Your outer box. Yeah. I mean, that, if, you're, if your safe set did not allow for you to hit the boundary conditions, and that's kind of natural for the quad rotor, <coughs> Um, then when, I, I don't see any reason you couldn't. Uh, why not just ignore the boundary conditions? Let the let the angles go to infinity if they want to, right? Um, but you have to then define your safe sets it, it, differently. So there's equivalence classes, right? And and that's I mean that's the challenge is how do you how do you how do you handle the fact that you can have the equivalence classes of points in the in the in the uh, in the um, space that you're working in, and I don't have a good answer for that. This is a generally a problem with parametric techniques is that they they don't work well in systems where you're not dealing with Euclidean uh, spaces, and typically their workaround is exactly what Claire said: is that you keep the system away from the the wraparound parts of the domain. Um, yeah. <laughs> you started with these uh, elderly, which I am one of them, <laughs> and the wheelchair, but then you move to this mathematics. Where is the connection? Did you, so I, I did you to apply be, it? so so for I, I so there's a to, close connection to the anesthesia problem. Like we can actually the models are linear. Um, we can use this technology. Which paper is that? I, I like to read it. Uh, the anesthesia one isn't listed here, but I can send oh, you some pointers yeah, to it. Um, and so there's a very close connection to the anesthesia problem. And we've been using ellipsoidal techniques on that with frustrating results in some cases. Um, the connection to the wheelchair was actually, the reason I did this was I read the paper by Sherman and Althoff, 
and where they're doing the uh, nominal trajectories, the MPC nominal trajectories, and then showing safety tubes around those nominal trajectories. And I thought, I can use that for the wheelchair, because the wheelchair is quite nonlinear. In fact, it's, it's uh, um, our, our models are, we, we've had a frustrating time getting the models right. So, all yeah. But um, now you gave me some <laughs> <laughs> So I'm, I'm hoping, I, I guess the short answer is that I'm hoping to deploy this in a model predictive framework like what Sherman and Althoff has, have proposed yeah. about nominal trajectories where I might be able to use this for uh, the wheelchair context. And, and you know, this, the, 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 the math or the, the, the calculations here are actually relatively simple calculations, and I think you could implement them very, very fast. Uh, so. Yeah. so Ian, very much in line with what you were saying right now, um, if, if you have some other method that can perhaps give you a nominal trajectory that is believed to be, that is believed to be safe or that you're trying to track, um, how well can this kind of method extend to time-varying linear systems so that you could do perhaps a linearization around a nominal trajectory and then Instantly. compute what happens to these zonotopes yeah. with an you A can, and B that dependent you, on time? You can, th this applies exactly to time-varying linear systems, discrete time. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there, there's nothing here that... Right. I, I left out the You're time. Multiplying different yeah. matrices. Right. That's. Yeah. It seems like it's. So I left out the time to, varying to because extend. otherwise the, the the equations get even bigger mm -hmm. when you put function of t in every single case. So right. yeah, I, I mean that was the observation that that Sherman and Althoff made in, in the, their application in the context of reach sets. Uh, is yeah, you can you can linearize this. You linearize this at each point in time about the nominal trajectory. Mm -hmm. And so you can keep the linearization error, really, you can keep it nicely under control. Nice. Uh, and, and so, I, yeah, I, if, if you're interested in this stuff, I really recommend the three papers they published in 2017, very nicely written, three different ways of tackling the reachability pro version of this. Um, mm -hmm. It's really focused on synthesizing controls, a single control, rather right. than the shared control framework. And so uh -huh. that this work is, can we use this in the context of, of getting control, safe control sets as opposed to synthesizing an individual control? Right, of least restrictive laws, basically. Yes, exactly. Whereas they're, they're trying to synthesize a, a control and then showing that that, that control is, is in fact guarantee, has guarantee properties uh, and, and applying it to some neat robotics problems. So, yeah. All right. Well... I think with that, let's thank Ian again. Thank you very much.